Well, <laughs> good evening, everyone. And, uh, and so it's a great pleasure this evening to welcome Helen Haste. She's an emerita professor in psychology at the University of Bath, where she was first appointed in 1971. For the last two decades, she has also been a visiting professor at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Her work has focused on cultural values, civic engagement, and social change, with particular relevance to education. She has authored eight books, as well as numerous research papers, and she has a long-standing interest in the communication of science and technology and the relation between scientific ideas and culture, and she has been a, a frequent broadcaster. Helen. Thank you very much, Don. It's so nice to be here on this lovely evening. We are very brave to have come out in such large numbers. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, actually. I, I love this organization. Something that goes back 200 years. It was originally founded to bridge the disciplines of science and literature, the arts and so forth, and it's done so well over this last 200 years. And I'm very proud to have spoken here in the past, and I'm very proud to be here again today talking to you all. So I'm going to talk about uncertainty, which I think is an issue that obviously pretty salient and current at the moment. Um, if we just look at examples of some pictures which capture the, the, the concept of our current uncertainty, that of course is a movie, but it applies much as much to contemporary situation. And then of course this one is, I, I find this picture extremely poignant, a lone polar bear on the very last glacier in the Arctic Ocean. So, we live in times of change, and we have to learn to manage these effectively. Whoops, because the future's not just more of the same. And basically, I'll be looking at how COVID and other events have dislocated our planning activities and disturbed our certainties radically. Now, we have to bear in mind that our vision of the future whether it's about ourselves or about society, is embedded in our present. In other words, we predict from our present concerns, our present goals and values. And we believe also, sadly, um, perhaps unwisely, that what works now will work again in the future. And furthermore, furthermore, the problems we face today are the same problems we'll face in the future. So basically, our vision of the future and therefore our capacity to deal with uncertainty of the future is heavily distorted by how we view the present. And we're also very prone to become an anxious about ambiguity and uncertainty. I'm now going to involve you in a short thought experiment. I'm going to show you a picture for about less than half a minute and I'll ask you questions about the picture afterwards. Okay, now I'm sure this picture is familiar to you. It's obviously by M.C. Escher, as you know. It's a kind of sneaky personality test. Don't put your hands up, don't reveal yourselves, but think to yourselves, did you find yourselves more comfortable looking at the top or bottom of the picture where they're quite clearly a geese or fish? Or did you find yourself intrigued by the middle section where it's uncertain whether they are geese or fish? If you found yourself looking at the top and bottom more than the middle, 
Did you feel uncomfortable about the middle section? Did you feel uncertain about ambiguity? As I said, I'm not asking you to raise your hands, but this is a wonderful, I use this in lots of lectures. It's a wonderful way of people feeling whether they are actually unhappy with uncertainty and ambiguity or not. Of course, Escher plays on this the whole time. All right, now what's happened in the last few years? Last four or five years have been extraordinary in many ways. We've had COVID-19 that we all lived through. Second, we had first an acceleration of climate change, but much more important culturally was the awareness of climate change. Uh, it isn't just whether climate change has accelerated, but actually we have really accelerated in our understanding of it. And thirdly, we've had a very interesting social change which are called by, on the whole, the right-wing press, the rise of wokeness, which is not a term I particularly like. But basically the point is it's reframing and rethinking of our history and how contemporary symbols are embedded in them. But the interesting point, I think, is not only that, but also the extraordinary backlash we've seen against wokeness, the resistance to thinking about things in historical terms. And for, finally, of course, we've had two significant wars that are not only awful in the way that wars always are, but particularly the most recent one is very, very challenging to all of us, I think, ethically, where we stand on the issues around Israel and Gaza, I think preoccupy many dinner table conversations. Okay. So if we want to look at how we understand change um, how, and are able to predict and prescribe, we have to think about various strategies, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Basically, we have to understand change if we are going to be able to predict it. And of course, prediction and prescription go together. If I know what's going to happen next, I can decide what I ought to be doing about it and what you ought to be doing about it. So let's consider change and understanding it. First of all, change is not always linear or progressive. It's often rupturing. That's the current phrase that social scientists are using. And what's happened is we've assumed a kind of optimistic tide of progressivism, increasing global responsibility and increasing awareness. And this general, it's a really post-enlightenment thing, really, has framed many of the contemporary ethical debates and almost all of our education agendas. We believe education can push that, that gradual progressive um, trajectory onwards. Okay, fine. What questions did we not ask when we were thinking about these models? So let's look at the two contrasting stories about change. One story is that change takes place gradually and on the whole, it's towards improvement. And of course, we believe we can predict these kinds of change. And furthermore, we can influence this kind of change. The second model of change is that it takes place suddenly and surprisingly. It may have quite dramatic consequences which disrupt in many ways. And the point is that we are not prepared for this and we have not even imagined it was possible. For those of you who have some knowledge of the history of geology, you will recognize the distinction between gradualistic models of evolution and punctuated equilibrium as put forward by people like Stephen Jay Gould. But the concept of a change, and we'll, I represent it. This is our gradual picture of change, getting better all the time. And then this, if you like, is our picture um, of uh, rupture. Now, of course, it's not exactly rupture, but I rather like these spiky mountains. And I think these spiky mountains kind of reflect the kind of rupture that I'm, I'm, I'm envisaging we should think about in terms of that kind of change. All right, so what kind of futures do we, can we see? What kind of futures are there? And there are th three kinds of futures were identified by Donald Rumsfeld of all people, though he was owed quite a lot to some Persian um, um, philosopher way back in the 13th century. Uh, one kind of future is known knowns. In other words, we know what to expect and we know how to deal with them. The second kind of futures are known unknowns. We know what we don't know, but we kind of sort of can anticipate how we might adapt to the new conditions. So we know that we, 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 we know that something is happening. We don't know what it is yet, but we can vaguely think we can handle it when it happens. The third kind of unknown is the unknown unknowns. We don't know what is ahead of us, nor do we know what we'll need to adapt. 
And we must therefore be open to, guess what? Uncertainty. Now, a, 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 a good friend of mine who's a systems engineer called William Gosling, who works in engineering, therefore talking about the history of technology, has rephrased this slightly differently in the context of technology, in trying to understand how, how things happen, particularly in the technological context, but it applies equally well in the social context. One model, which is very much the same as known knowns, the future will be more of the same. Life will be very similar to what it is today in 50 years time, a few technological advances maybe, but fundamentally we'd recognize it if we came back. The second kind of change is quantity into quality. Now that kind of change, the best epitome of that will be the village becomes a town, the town becomes a city. There's a continuity there, but as the increasing um, structure of the social environment changes, the whole culture and everything around it changes. A city and a village are not the same thing. And the third one is what he called the knight's move. Now, the knight's move is obviously like chess. You know, it does that. Something funny happens and it changes. And the context of technology, the microchip revolution, was a mega, mega night's move because basically we didn't anticipate it. It was in itself very, very much an unknown unknown. Some of you may remember this, most of you may remember this. And when it happened, we had no ways of anticipating it, not even technologically expert people, not even in the industry, though some of them had a sort of idea. But the point about the night's move is everything changes and we can't predict it. So let's consider what we how we respond to this. Well, people mainly think in terms of more of the same, in terms of known knowns. Uh, some people, if they're trained or have very good imagination, can think about the quantity and quality, the known unknowns. Almost nobody can imagine the night's move, the unknown unknowns. So we're ra really in rather um, a quandary. So what actually happens in night's moves and ruptures? Well, a lot of things happen. What we take for granted as certain is changed or challenged. Our values and our priorities about what is important to do, the practice priorities, change. Our goals change and our conceptions of what will be the utopia or dystopia of the future, they change. We have underlying narratives and explanations for how things are, how they were, how they should be, how they will be. They change. And therefore, of course, if all these things change, what skills do we need to be able to uh, work with them? Now, looking at this audience, and I hope I'm saying positive and complimentary things about you, it's quite convenient that the majority of you have lived through long enough to understand something about experience of these kinds of changes in your lifetime and in the time that you were working as well. So yeah, I'm sure many of you can actually remember the microchip revolution and its consequences. You're nodding, good, thank you. So I, I'm being very nice to you. I mean, I, I can claim to be part of the same group. After all, I had my 80th birthday in March, so I, I share the, uh, the experience of all those years. Okay, so overall, the message is that we should be assuming a future of radical uncertainty, and we should be preparing for this. Now, there's a wonderful book, which I thoroughly recommend by John Kay and Mervyn King, who's a former chair of the Bank of England. It's called Radical Uncertainty. It's very accessible. And he attack, they attack economists because they say that economists are misled by their belief in algorithms that appear to predict rational decisions based on utility, but actually they can't. Instead, they should learn to manage uncertainty. Hands up the economists in the room. One, okay. <laughs> you can tell me later whether you agree with them, but all right. So what are the consequences of the uncertainty, anxiety, and the, what I called the seductions of certainty. I shall talk about the seductions of certainty shortly. Right, this is the slide which I lay out the problems. First of all, we have far too quick acceptance of attractive and simple solutions. And also of the evidence, note the inverted commas, that appears 
to support these solutions. There's a general resistance to change, There's a general conservative with a small c worldview. In other words, an unwillingness to, to accept change or react to it. A suspicion of points of view and of people who challenge one's comfort zones. The sort of what we do is we other them. They're not us, they're other people. They have different views. They're the enemy. They're ignorant, they're stupid. They're a member of whatever particular American, or, or, or I said American, sorry, I shouldn't have said American, but whatever particular social group you happen to be regarding currently is lacking in culture. And um, it's interesting living in America for 20 years because I hadn't realized that I got there how much I had grown up with the view that America was a place which lacked culture and history. Uh, and I, was, had to, I had to carefully um, rephrase my way of thinking about the world quite fast. I didn't know I believed that, by the way. I just discovered I did when I got there. <laughs> okay, furthermore, we have an unwillingness um, to, or even an inability to question one's own or one's own group's assumptions, our theories and values. This is all part of the seduction to certainty and the anxiety about uncertainty. And of course, we're attractive to, attracted to conspiracy theories, which of course encompass all these. I'm going to talk a little bit about them uh, in a minute or two. Okay, let's look at people who've said strong things about certainty and what's wrong with it. Well, Voltaire said, doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. And Oscar Wilde, who's obviously always his tongue in cheek, consistency is the last refuge of the unimaginative. I, I found this actually, when, which was, uh, I, will, I can say the assumption that you all remember Jacob Bonosky in The Ascent of Man. Uh, he was a very interesting man who was obviously passionately dedicated to science, but passionately aware that science was fallible and that scientists sometimes make assertions which were exactly, not exactly sustainable. And he was certainly talking, I won't actually read it out because it's on the screen, but um, he does conclude, well, read it, I'll read it to you, read it, you can read it, so. And again, you know, the question that we should embrace uncertainty, not run away from it, including in science. Right, now, if we're going to attack problems, deal with problems, particularly social problems, how do we go about it? Well, I like, my, I like this slide I've got, which is, if we're fighting malaria, we do not harangue the mosquito. Naughty mosquito, stop biting me. Stop spreading malaria. We actually explore the environment the mosquito lives in and do something about that to prevent malaria. So questions we have to ask, how do we think? In order to understand what we are doing about uncertainty, we have to ask ourselves how we actually think that we think and how do we think? Now, there are th I think there are three components of looking at the how we think question. What do we believe, like the, the factual bit? Why do we believe it? What are our criteria for what counts as evidence? And the third one is why does it matter to us that we do believe it, whatever it is? Because that's an important element in it. So, and behind all this is a key question, which is how do we think we should think and how we actually think and as I say, mind the gap, the gap. Now there is a tendency, I mean, the, I have to say, the, I'm currently writing about all this stuff, so I'm fairly immersed in a vast, vast amount of literature on the subject. And there are a lot of people who are writing about how to resolve the problems of, of uncertainty and chaos and all these terrible things that are happening to us. And there are a lot of people who are pleading for rationality but what do they mean by rationality? How do they define it? Uh, and what's wrong with their definitions of rationality that they might actually not work? Now, obviously errors are important in this. It's very easy to demonstrate that we make errors. Now you're all extremely rational, probably very highly educated people. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the kind of errors that everybody makes. 
this is the, fir the first one is subjective. I'll read it out to you. We know that with presuming the, the, if a coin is an equally balanced one, over 100 throws, 50 will be heads and 50 will be tails. And we also know that every single time we flip that coin, there's a 50% chance it'll be heads or tails. We know this. There's absolutely, an, there's absolutely no relationship between our last throw and our next throw. However, if you see that string of heads and tails, what is your, you'll be off flipping this coin, what's your inclination about what your next throw will yield? And you needn't answer me. It could be either of two things, both of which are actually wrong. But okay, we, we, but, I mean, I, as you all had the experience, I wanted to take you through it. Here's another one. I won't ask you to put your hands up, but how many of you immediately thought, assume that the case cost 10 pounds? What does it actually cost? Five. I, I mean, you can feel proud of yourself if you've got to five. Yes, it's a very easy mistake to make. It's a very common one. It's an error that we, it's a, it's a common kind of error that we make if we go too, obviously too quickly and don't reflect. Now, in a sense, you could say, okay, rationality should be, how do we avoid those errors? And to some extent, this is a very useful point. But, 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 what errors tell us is that the first of all, all our errors reveal actually how we think because the mistakes we make reveal how we're thinking. And we therefore assume that to improve reasoning, we should believe we should educate to reduce errors. But again, what kind of errors? Secondly, the areas that we focus on when we're trying to explain thinking and reason tend to reveal the underlying theories that we have about the nature of thinking and reason. So which areas you think are important to dwell on and worry about very much reflects what you think is actually going on when we think. And this is true whether we're lay people or experts. I'm going to take you through now three different versions of ways of managing the the question of what rationality is or could be, and indeed isn't. Let's take cognitive science number one. Uh, for, I'm not, I put some names up, but don't worry about names. Basically, this argument is that there are two systems of thinking. In system one, our thinking is very fast, and we process information primarily based on familiar um, knowledge and, and previous decision-making and experience generally, very fast. In system two, our thinking is slower. It's focused more on logic and reasoning and on carefully scrutinizing a wide range of what we would deem to be evidence. In other words, seeing the whole, making sure we see the whole field. That's the cognitive science one model. So they split between system one and system two. The second cognitive science, well, it's, and they look at kind of errors that the system, system one thinking, which of course is the not perfect reasoning. Basically, what we do in, in system one thinking, that's a fast thinking, we tend to overgeneralize from how representative or topical, or typical rather, particular people's roles or attributes are uh, based on, for example, stereotypes. We, we jump to conclusions based on a stereotype, and we assume this person's representative or this objects representative and we generalize from it without recognizing it probably isn't necessarily representative. We also rely on more available or more familiar sources rather than searching more widely for, for, for more information or more points of view. Uh, we often mistake correlation and causality. Things that happened before something or other do not cause them, they simply happen first, for example. But the, um, the Confusion of correlation and causality is a very common problem that if we're using what these cognitive science would call system one. And finally, using an inappropriate norm or baseline to make judgments or predictions. Um, I, I, I can't say I'm embarrassed exactly, but I look back with a certain amount of shame that 
When I was about 13 or 14, I made the statement to my family that I concluded that the Guardian newspaper must be the most popular newspaper in Britain because all our friends read it. <laughs> Reflects a lot of things. Right? Yeah. All right, let's look at cognitive scientist number two. This is a quite different point of view. In a sense, it's elevating system one. Basically, what they are arguing is our primary mode of processing information, what we actually do when we're thinking and making decisions is through what's called heuristics or some people call intuition. It's fast and frugal, very rapid processing information, which draws upon well-tried knowledge and experience. And it, we are making decisions which a, a, a economist Herbert Simon called satisficing. Satisficing is adequate for the purpose. In other words, it, it, it'll do basically. So we, we make a decision and if it has enough of bits and pieces that we feel are relevant and valid and appropriate evidence, we'll, we'll be happy with the decision. Um, rather than treating um, each uh, situation, for example, as requiring a lot of deliberation and calculation and thinking about all possible variables. Also in, built into this is the idea that reason and emotion are entwined, not in conflict. I'm not going to dwell on that today. It's just, just another talk, but um, we have historically had the view that reason and emotion are in conflict with each other and that reason is, is un either undermined by emotion or they're separate domains or something. Uh, for the last 20 or so years, we've known that the brain doesn't separate reason and emotion. We cannot separate reason and emotion, we make decisions. If we don't have any emotion in our decisions, we will not make good decisions. And this is a, a neurologically based finding, which rather fundamentally changes some of the enlightenment assumptions that we have probably grown up with. And of course, the other thing too, is that we have as individuals in our rapid, fast and frugal reasoning, we have a lot of checks and balances based on our experiences um, that help to monitor the judgments that we make. So we don't always make a total and complete fool of ourselves. So the point about heuristics, is that it's the primary mode of human everyday thinking and it's highly adapted to our needs. We couldn't possibly survive if every single decision we made had to go through a, a number of different possibilities and variables and evidence. How do you get breakfast to heaven's sake? Let alone how do you make a decision about what house to buy? We bring a framework of values and assumptions to our decision making. Now these, we, we have a whole array of values and assumptions and they help us selectively to choose the arguments. Now, this is very efficient, but some people call it bias. If I have a point of view and things I believe in, and I, I, I will sustain that point of view and defend it, you could say I'm biased. Well, I kind of am, but at the same time, that's part of the intuitive heuristic. It's what we do as humans. We can't, we can't do things without values, without having a commitment. And therefore, we have to take it into account in understanding thinking and not regard it as a, an unfortunate byproduct of irrationality. And we also develop the capacity within this framework to question our own judgments validity. We, we become able to actually judge over time when we are actually being quite stupid and making the wrong assumptions. And of course, we are constantly, constantly, constantly in human social interaction and we're constantly being evaluated and criticized by everybody else around us at length. Cognitive science number three develops this because these people argue that reason itself is a social process. It isn't an only an in inside the head individual process. It's got two functions. We use reason for two purposes. One is that we justify our arguments to ourselves. So a lot of the time what we're doing when we're reasoning is actually creating consistency in our own making of meaning. Uh, a quotation from them is to say, logic helps to simplify and schematize our intuitive or heuristic arguments. In other words, post hoc rationalization rules, if you like. And secondly, we are effectively engaging in argumentation with others all the time even if we're doing it inside our own heads. We are in constant dialogue with others, literally or metaphorically. And the primary way we overcome our biases, whatever sort they are, is through argumentation 
with others. So we really, really have to bring in the idea that human beings are actually social beings, not just living inside their heads. So concluding a little bit from these kind of perspectives, individual reasoning is about finding frameworks that enable us to make sense of our experience and to deal with new information. That's what we're doing inside our heads. And we use reason to justify these because we're, what, what we believe is central to who we are is our identity. So the, our, our reason is basically justifying our identity and who we are. We can adjust our criteria for our, for, for our justifications of our decisions when we find that they no longer work, they're no longer consistent for our personal logic. We're changing our minds all the time, in other words. And of course, the other thing is the frameworks that we draw upon derive from interaction with other people and, of course, from the culture in which we live. Because we do not come, we do not make any decision in isolation from who we are, where we are, and, and at this particular point in time, this particular place, this particular space in our identity and our meaning making. And of course, we're in constant dialogue, constant debate, constant argumentation with others who will, will most helpfully challenge the flaws in our justification. So, as you might gather, I'm rather happier with cognitive science three than one. I shouldn't buy, expect, I shouldn't expose my biases, should I? Um, now, the psychologist Jerome Brunner makes a very important point that humans are not just puzzle solvers. An awful lot of my colleagues in psychology only focus on human beings as puzzle solvers. And it's getting worse in psychology, I mean. And we all, as if we're all living just inside our heads. We are also storytellers and we are also tool users. And we use the tools of language and of imagery and symbols and so forth. And we tell stories to make sense and share meaning. I don't mean tell stories meaning tell lies. I mean tell stories, narratives. And narratives are central to our understanding and how we communicate. Because we embed things in a story. We don't just have facts. We embed them in a story. I'm going to talk about this a bit more in a minute. And it's so important to recognize that within this, the facts and the logical propositions that we hold to be true are, should be considered in context. Not only why we regard them as true, in other words, what are our criteria for evidence, but also why is that particular fact or that proposition important in this situation? I mean, some we've got, we, we have our heads is, are full of facts. Some facts are important if, sometimes, other facts are not important. When we're top, having, engaging in arguing with people, some facts are important because in this context, in this argument, that fact is going to be powerful in persuading them it's up, 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 to take, come around to our point of view. Other facts are not important, or we'd like to say they weren't important. So it isn't only, the, the facts can be facts, but their importance and their salience depends on how we're using them in the particular story that we are telling, because we are always telling stories. What do we mean by stories? Well, basically a story includes causes, whether they're implicit or explicit, but the past, for example, what happened before, what the consequences are um, of our present actions, uh, what will happen as, as a consequence of what's happening here now, and we, we, see the we see it as a continuity. We see things continuously. We don't see things in isolation. We see them as what happened yesterday, today, tomorrow, whatever it is, uh, what we thought about before, what somebody else thought about before, what we think about now, what we'll think about tomorrow, what somebody else will think about tomorrow. It's a continuous process. It isn't a, time isn't like that, time is like that. And also a story appeals to emotion and identity, who we are not only logic, as I said before, what matters to us is how it fits into our stories. And also a story must be comprehensible to the audience because our story will only work as an explanation if we share the experience, share the culture, share the references, the illusions, the symbols, the jokes, uh, which um, the audience has with us so we can talk on the same wavelength as it were, 
use a different metaphor. Um, and if we are not able to make our story comprehensible to the audience, um, because what we're talking about isn't shared or isn't um, commonly known, we have to justify it or explain it at great length. So a story is the way that we frame and communicate what we are thinking and how we are thinking. What do narratives do? Well, narratives have a starting point, they have a sequence, and they have an ending. They have a plot, basically. And as I said, these imply causality and consequence. There's a sort of moral dimension to it. They imply values. If I tell you a story, if you think sometimes at this point in the, in the, when I'm talking about this, I, I go into talking about you know, the, the moral significance of, um, of Goldilocks or Snow White, because the story isn't just about Snow White or Goldilocks. It's about all the values that are the baggage of values around the stories, the fairy tales that we tell kids. We, we tell stories to convey values and the values that when in, in, in not in a fairy tale context, even in an ordinary context, if you if you go home tonight and talk about what you what you did this afternoon to your family or somebody else, it'll be ridden with values because and shared assumptions and shared illusions. And what you say, how you refer to people, will be reflecting the underlying values that you that you hold and you assume they hold and share with you. Also, what stories do, narratives do, is they position the actors. Now, this is both in terms of each other. In this, any story, you've got the powerful person, the victim, the, the, the hero, the villain, and so on. Um, so in a sense, any individual in the story is positioned vis-a-vis -vis individuals, other individuals in the story. But also um, the audience, because the, who I choose to, to portray as a hero, a, su a, su a successful person, an unsuccessful person, a successful outcome, um, it is assuming that the story is positioning me and you. If I, how I talk to you as an audience assumes things I share with you. Uh, if, and I, if I don't assume you share them, I have to explain them and give you lots of other examples to, to, to demonstrate them. So also a story indicates where agency lies, not just who has power, but who can actually make things happen. If you think of all those fairy tales you told your kids, uh, you know, who's the ones who have have failed, not because they're not heroic, but they simply don't have any power. Who, what kind of people in stories have power? Not only fairy tales, in all stories we tell. We, we convey a huge amount in the stories and they are essential to everything we do in ordinary conversation, not just when talking to our children at bedtime. Now, I think of some examples. Uh, uh, for example, let's take... Um, a couple of um, conspiracy theories. Um, if you would like to believe or do believe, for example, that um, the moon landings were faked in Hollywood uh, and it was a scientist or probably the government tried to draw the wool over our eyes. Right, that's one of the conspiracy theories, okay? Now, what's the story behind that? Not just the story about the moon landings. What are the stories you bring in? Let's assume for the sake of argument, you do take the view that it was all faked in the Hollywood backlot. Okay, who has to go into, come into that story to make it credible? Okay, somebody has to be a conspirator, a conspirator who actually wanted the, the people to believe in the moon landings. There also has to be a story that the moon landing was important to somebody or it wouldn't have worked. So there's a story there about the whole of the, the space program. There are stories about heroism. There are stories about Hollywood being basically um, the, 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 the tools of, of the lying government or the, the tools of fantasy. Let's take climate change. We've got two, let's take the people who are climate skeptics and people who are concerned about doing something about climate change. The stories behind what has caused climate change, what we can do about climate change, who can do it, how we can do it. And these are not just factual information about what is possible, they're the stories we will tell about how we can go about doing something about what has happened in the past and what will happen in the future, which again is a, a continuous narrative. And they're different stories, you draw on different stories if you are a climate skeptic from if you are um, a person who is concerned about taking seriously the climate change data and doing something about it. So these are examples of uh, the way that we are embedded in the stories that we tell. And stories are not out there fantasies, they are inherent 
in making sense. We cannot make sense. You can almost argue we can't make sense except through narratives, because that's how we function. I mean, think about it. Well, if you are parents, many of you will be. Very small children, quite small children, two years old. If you um, change the story at bedtime, they will tell you firmly that you have changed the story. It's not right, it's wrong. But it, they're about four or five before they can actually do serious logic. So we're embedded in understanding, almost evolved to understand stories before we, and, and, and that form of conveying information and reasoning before we can actually manage what we might later call eventually, eventually system two thinking type logic. So the social psychologist Michael Billig argues, and very, I find it's a very insightful point. We only understand the meaning of something when we realize what it's arguing against. So it, it, it might be, if you simply say it's raining, which it is, or it was, now, all right, you, that could be simply a statement, it's raining, but why would you say it? What's the reason you say, it? well, it's, it's raining. It was sunny yesterday, why isn't it sunny today? Or it's raining, I can't go out, I can't come to this fantastic lecture this evening, whatever. You know, I mean, so when you, people make a statement, this implied, it's not, it doesn't exist in isolation. We're arguing against something or in favor of something by making a statement. And when you think of narratives in that way, you realize that the stories you tell, the illustrations you give, the examples you give are all ways of perhaps in some ways countering or elaborating a particular perspective that you want to convey. So when we get around to actually seeing change or trying to effect change, we have to remember that change involves new narratives or what we'll call counter narratives that don't simply build on or deny the previous narrative, but construct new bases for explanation, new ways of thinking, new core values and new salient issues. We don't just tweak when, when, when there is, when there is I mean, think what COVID did to your lives, the narratives it changed, the, let alone you know, what you did during the day, but the whole way you thought about things. Our narratives were profoundly changed perforce through COVID because that's what happens in, in ruptures. And if we're going to anticipate change, which is my point about prediction and prescription, we have to ask the kind of questions which will anticipate the surprises, not just the continuities that the future will bring, if we can. Let's look at the role of counter narratives. How do we argue against, um, against others? How do we engage in this important role of moving towards a more, um, uh, if you like, quasi-rational point of view because everybody's arguing and saying what's wrong with your particular point of view and what's right with theirs. And ultimately we hope that something comes out of it, um, which is at least different, if not necessarily better. So how do we actually argue against others? All right. So, well, there's different kinds of counter narratives. They're the sort where you're basically arguing within the existing story. Um, and you're saying, well, no, basically you're wrong on that particular point. Let's take, um, let's take climate change. So you, if, you're, if your counter narrative is, well, you know, you're talk, you, you're, you, one of you is a skeptic, one of you is, is not a skeptic on this topic. You could argue at this sort of level within the current story, we can quibble about, well, is it going to be 1% or 2% rise in temperatures? Um, is this scientist, this particular scientist, more accurate than that scientist, et cetera? But you're still, you're, you're questioning, you're, you're saying, well, you know, I don't accept your particular point on your position on climate change because I think you're misread, misreading the evidence. But in a sense, you're not really going very far into delving into, the, into counter narratives and change. Second kind, where you change the dominant values, but stay within the frame of the narrative. So you say, OK, we, we agree, perhaps we can, we can say that um, even though we disagree, perhaps about how much the, wa the waters will rise, etc. But the really important thing is that you don't think it matters and you think it's happening anyway. And I think that we should actually be doing something about it, that we should be actually doing something First of all, learning more about it, knowing more about it, and doing something about it. But basically, um, we're still saying that the, the, the 
gradual climate change is relatively gradual um but we what we do about it is 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 is, is something we disagree on or we can go com go further completely and say look actually we're talking about something completely different that we are no longer thinking we cannot talk to each other because you believe climate change isn't happening at all um and it's a big conspiracy on the part of, of various governments to um or scientists indeed to to pull the wool over the eyes of the public um and it's, it's all rotten it's all rubbish and i'm not going to believe in it um i'm I, in contrast with what you would like to say somebody who is a climate non-denier non-skeptic about the not only the seriousness of the issue but the importance of major 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 decision making and policy changes at government level i mean if you've got friends i'm sure you've all had these conversations you've all got friends on either side of that particular branch you've had these discussions and you may have lost friends if you had to get to the third point of managing the counter narratives because there comes a point where you simply can't basically at all connect because you're on a different narrative plane Okay, so um, oh, I wrote this some time ago. It's a bit technical, but I thought I'd be, I, let, I would like my vanity to, 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 to be paraded. Progress in, any, uh, progress in any field of knowledge, I could say in that change, in any field of knowledge derives from asking the right new questions at the right time when the field is receptive to them. The absence of new emerging questions not only stunts the field, that perpetuates existing metaphors, narratives, and models which constrain innovation. Pitting new ideas against the old orthodoxy can just invert the old terms of reference and not truly alter the argument. Innovation requires a challenge to previously taken for granted assumptions. Now, I wrote that actually in the context of how what happens in science, because science doesn't Science really only scientific theory only changes really when somebody notices an anomaly and takes it seriously and actually completely changes how they think about things. I mean, playing around with um, with experiments is extremely important, but it, ultimately change takes place only when somebody has actually changed the essentially changed the game completely. And again, many of you have a science background; you'll know what I'm talking about. So it isn't just a question of doing the right experiments; it's a question of thinking in different ways about how. Um, how the, 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 the data has to be looked at quite differently, new data found, new theories developed, and uh, new ways of thinking developed. Um, for example, and again, I'm not a physicist um, or an astronomer, but what's happening in the world of physics like quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and so on, and also what's happening as we learn more and more about the boundaries of the universe or non-boundaries of the universe. Um, I, I mean, it doesn't affect my way, my world very much, it's not my, my world. But I know that for people who are thinking about these things, it's a fundamentally different way of thinking about things, not just more data to elaborate the existing narratives. So how do you prepare young people for an uncertain future? What competences and skills do they need? I'm arguing that they need two. Now, I said young people because I'm an education person, but really all of us. What do we need, we need? to deal with, to learn, to acquire, to manage the future. And I think there are two, two areas. One is the area of reflection and the other is the area of argumentation and dialogue. Because I want to argue that I like cognitive scientist number three are fundamentally reason doesn't exist really except within and around a social environment we can individually reason but fundamentally we are social beings engaged in dialogue and that's how we actually function um, even if it's inside our heads having a dialogue as it were with our rem remember conversations with others okay what do we mean by these the capacity so how I haven't, I'm not tonight going to talk about the education programs that I think could be used to encourage young people in, in their education, in the formal education context, to be more effective at doing these things. I leave it to you perhaps to draw the conclusions. Some of you may be educators. But let's consider what we need to be able to do. What are 
our criteria for what counts as evidence. We have to be able to reflect upon that, reflecting, thinking about it, questioning our assumptions, wondering, talking to somebody saying, what's wrong with my arguments? What's right with them? What are the criteria that we use for what counts as evidence? Because that's pretty crucial, particularly in conspiracy theories. What are the assumptions that we make about how we select the relevant information for what are actually our rapid, heuristic, intuitive information processing? What, what, do, we, what do we assume to be a, a valid thing to bring into the argument, if you like? A valid bit of data. And not, that's not just about evidence. It's also a question about um, how we make, make the story work. <clears throat> Have we actually considered, as we reflect upon this, that there are usually several possible options or possible futures, not just one right answer? There is a tendency, I think probably it's, it's no longer around. When, when many of you in the audience were in a primary school, shall we say, there was a bit of a tendency for people to say, well, there is one right answer, don't be distracted, concentrate. Uh, and, and what's more, the teacher knows the right answer. Well, perhaps not so much. In China, the teacher knows the right answer as well as there being one right answer. I've worked in China as well. But on the whole, we're not doing that so much nowadays. We're saying there are many possible solutions. There are many right answers. How do we manage, negotiate our way amongst them so we can come to some sensible conclusions? And finally, particularly, what matters to us? What are our values, our goals, the narratives that define who we are? are ah, when we make sense of the world. Why is this particular piece of evidence, why is this solution important to our identity? Why does it matter to me if I am, if I am a climate skeptic? Why does it matter to me uh, if I believe that um, the moon landings weren't faked? Why does it matter to me even that there are some decisions about the right, the, the, the right situation in the particular international conflict, for example. Why does it, not only what is my reasoning, but why does it matter to me? Why am I, why am I purveying this? Why am I arguing for it? Because unless I know why I'm doing it, I won't understand the reflections. Okay, what are the skills? The skills of argumentation, well, here's a list of them. <clears throat> Recognizing one's own perspective, where you're coming from, and how that positions others vis-a-vis -vis yourself. Are you my enemy? Are you my friend? Are you my ally? Are you an interesting person to argue with, but we, et cetera. Recognizing other people's perspectives and their assumptions, their goals, frames and values. Sadly, we often don't do that. We tend to inflict our own perspectives on others. We don't actually say, well, where are you coming from? You know, why, why, are you, why are you arguing that? Where are you coming from? And that's a very good question to ask, is not only what you believe, but where are you coming from? Why, do, why is it important to you to believe this? Um, I, I think one of my, the more extreme conspiracy theories that I've seen recently is the belief that um, God sent Trump to save America. I, I'm sure it's true. I, I, but why do I believe it? Oh, I should remember, I should tell you, of course, that you know, last week I was I was on Zoom to Elvis and JFK, who are having a very nice time in their Caribbean island. Thank you very much. Um, okay, recognizing also the cultural framework within which dialogue is taking place. What is the context, the cultural context? What are we assuming we share culturally? And also recognizing how other people's perspectives will challenge our perspective and what are the implications of this challenge? Why should, how, how is it that understanding where you're coming from will help me understand maybe what I should question about where I'm coming from? And then of course, ultimately the actual, if you like, the act of negotiating dialogic interaction itself. So a bit of a summary, the competences we need, managing ambiguity and diversity, having the skills and inclinations for critical argumentation and perspective taking, developing a sense of agency and responsibility, and managing the effective intersection of emotion and reason. This is a questionnaire item, which I, okay, it comes from a questionnaire I was using, um, which would be obviously a measure of, of managing ambiguity. 
I'm not very worried about when things go unclear or uncertain. I find ambiguity interesting, and I enjoy interacting with a wide range of different people, places, ideas, and styles. If you said yes to all that, you probably were quite happy in the middle section of the Escher picture. And I, I mentioned agents, agents and responsibility. I haven't talked about that, but it's quite important also, which is, again, these are items that come from a questionnaire. I feel able to make decisions about moral and social issues. I feel able to take responsibility, organizing in leadership roles. I found new experiences a challenge rather than a threat. I feel able to act in a crisis situation such as an accident or when arrangements are suddenly changed. And I do think agents and responsibility are a crucial part of managing uncertainty. I haven't dwelt on it today, but it will be in the book I'm trying to get around to finish to writing. Final comment, innovation, and this is the truth, in all areas, innovation happens always on the margins, not in the mainstream. Therefore, if we want to innovate, or if successfully prescribe the future of changes, imagine the impossible, not the possible, and ask silly questions, not just the obvious ones. And consider also extremes and dreams, not just more of the same and mundane. Thank you. I'm looking forward to Q and A. So uh, Don is going to. Oh, thank you, Helen. There were quite an, so many points there where I could think of questions that uh, I imagine we might have a few. Who would like to uh, ask the first question or make the first comment? Okay, I will try to uh, pass the microphone to you. I think I'm going to sit down. Can you, yes, yes, please do. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I, I was locked in all the way through. Um, I, I was a teacher for many years, and through my teaching career, I got more and more concerned as I got older, and that may be part of what I'm wondering about, but that as I was getting older, the students, and if you don't mind going back to four or five slides to your argumentation, skills for argumentation, Ooh. bullet points, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. Right. Five slides back, just a minute. I, I think about five, step. maybe four, but almost at, at the oh, end. Oh, okay, argumentation. That yeah, one. That one. Yes. Uh, I, I increasingly concerned as I was getting older and the students felt younger and younger. Um, they but, they? Yeah. Uh, I was increasingly concerned that um, the, the, uh, most of the students were losing the capacity for these skills and becoming more and more intolerant. And I wonder if that's been your sense or am I just too much of a pessimist? Um. Well, there, there is also a slight problem that we, we recognize. Thank you, Joe. This is my daughter, by the way. Um, uh, there is a danger of saying, okay, the young are not like we were. Why weren't they were like we, why weren't they, why can't they be like we were perfect in every way as, as the 1950s song said. Um, no, I think there is a problem I, I, I'm, he I'm hesitant to say that they're less tolerant. I think they're tolerant of different things. I think there's a, a way in which um, what, what is important for them to be tolerant about is different from what's important to us to be tolerant about, even when we're adults teaching them. Um, I would certainly like to see young people being more open to different points of view that I'm talking about here, which I mean, I mean what I'm talking about in here would be a solution, if you like, to the problem. If we can get students to, uh, to engage in this kind of argumentation, then um, we will probably overcome some of the problems, many of the problems you're talking about. But uh, so I, I don't really want to comment on whether the young have got more intolerant, but I would more like to say, well, these, I think these, these conclusions I'm drawing from the literature um, 
would suggest if we can do this through education, we will overcome some of the problems you're describing, which I agree are real problems. So, um, <clears throat> is there another question? There's somebody over here. I'm just thinking quickly to follow on from that, if I may, please. Please do. Yes. Um, it was going through my head about whether I'm not teaching anymore, whether we're actually encouraging, helping young people within the curriculum to actually start to look at other people's point of view. I don't know whether that's happening now or not. I think that's an interesting point. I'm actually quite intrigued by the efforts that have gone into everywhere now to teach um, people to be more um, multicultural um, and inclusive and diverse. Now, I, I do think that the, the campaigns to increase awareness of diversity and awareness of the of potential exclusion and things are, are very important. But I think that sometimes they've they haven't quite worked as we'd hoped them to, hope, hope, hope that they would. So um, I think um, we, we can try and, and get young people to, to take other perspectives, um, but it, it is something we have to work very hard at. And I think quite early on, I mean, we, we tend to tell kids to be nice to each other. That's not enough. Being Unfortunately, being nice isn't enough. That'd make a good title for it, wouldn't it? Being nice isn't enough. We have to be able to actually manage what it means to, and again, perspective taking, I think, is really, is really the skill. Being able to take the point of view of others is, is I think, the, the answer. So, but it's, um, I, I'm not offering you solutions. Well, I think, um, uh, I, I have to say, I, I'm not actually working in schools. So, I, I, is anybody else in the audience working in schools who might be able to pick on? Uh, I'm, I'm retired for a while, but um, I would counter those points. What dismayed me towards the end of my career was the way schools had become increasingly intolerant. The yes. pupils were treated intolerantly by the schools. The whole system became incredibly intolerant. And when we get heads boasting that they're the strictest school in the country, I really think that head probably needs therapy. That <laughs> is not the way to bring up intolerant no. children no. to behave towards them intolerantly. Right, right. No, it's a very good point, and I, I think certainly, um, yes, I mean, I think pointing out that people are being intolerant. Um, and I, I actually think also that, in a sense, the, the emphasis on, on diversity and um, inclusion, which is focused, for good reason, on issues like um, race, ethnicity, uh, disability um, of various sorts, and, um, and religion, um, you, can, you can actually have a situation where people can have a climate which is saying, let's not be intolerant on those grounds. Forgetting that people can be extremely intolerant in other ways. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, intolerance isn't tied to a particular, one particular, in particular targets for the current fashion, but if you like, whatever the fashion is or time, prevailing culturally norm, acceptable norms, but, um, but there they can be intolerance existing um, elsewhere. I think the more we teach, in, the, I do think the more we teach perspective taking, which is actually very hard to teach because you have to get people to say, look, step back and don't just say, I must be nice to this person or even I must um, listen to them, take account of their point of view. Say, okay, get inside their heads. There's a phrase, I think, uh, walking in the shoes of others. Mm. I think it's, less, it's North American, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Well, I think we shouldn't be tolerant of a stupidity. And I think it is true what you're saying that we need to learn to be tolerant and teach students about being tolerant. But sometimes it's difficult to be tolerant of people who are intolerant. Yes. And, uh, you know, mm. and we mustn't be tolerant of stupidity mm. because sometimes if we go out of our way to try to understand stupidity, we may end up accepting stupidity. That's a very good point because if you do, it is a danger. If you do, if you do say, "Well, where are you coming from?" If I can, if I understand where you're coming from, I might be able to argue with you better. Um, as you say, to some extent, you can get to the point where, if I understand where you're coming from, I may lose the interest in arguing better. We we must perhaps we have to find out how we define stupidity. Is is, is stupidity um, simply not taking account of certain evidence, um, which could be a choice, for example. Um, as well as being stupid, or it could be a, 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 a kind of point of view of people being unable to handle uncertainty. So they, you please. Yes. 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 Yes.
Oh, there's still oh, some. Yes, yes. yes. Completely, completely denied, um, and you know, the benefit of the species, and evolution, evolution. yes, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or people who believe that, uh, you know, that uh, Adam and Eve were real people who came from God and who came back to the earth. I mean, if we start uh, uh, accepting these, these ideas. I mean, I, I find it incredibly frustrating. And this happens in the United States, for example. Yes. Where now they have, um, you know, all of these creations like this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also they face the condition as something of equal importance. Mm -hmm. and, and, and once we start thinking that creationism, uh, you know, that we must understand and tolerate it, we are going to the getting ourselves into a dangerous zone. Mm -hmm. Because we are giving validity to something that is illogical and something that we are scientifically is wrong. Yeah, I of course agree with you about the, the issues. I think the thing is how we go about it. I mean, I, I was, um, what I would have quite liked to, to take, if you take away with you is, is, is to think, well, you know, it, next time you're engaging in an argument with somebody who um, you don't agree with, um, if, if you go back and, and ask some of the questions that seem to arise from this kind of analysis by cognitive scientists, rather than saying, uh, you know, watch your evidence, say, why do you need to believe this? What is the underlying narrative in your, in your way of thinking that makes you need to believe this? So that they can, I don't think you've got much chance with creationists, actually. They tend to be a bit dyed in the wool, but um, I mean, um, or even some climate skeptics. But I think if you if the approach is to say, well, you know, not only your evidence is wrong or you're or you're misguided, but actually consider what your assumptions are, not only about the evidence, but also why it matters to you to believe this. I mean, what what is it in in the what what is your worldview? Well, why do you wait? I mean, it's, I gave it. I'm almost jokingly mentioned God. God gave us Trump. Because it's, it's, I mean, of course, like, that's bizarre. But you know, if and you say, why do people believe that? Well, you can say, okay, looking for a father figure or whatever. But I mean, if you actually go and say, you know, why, why is it that you feel the need for a father figure, a leader? Why do you need to believe that Trump is that father figure or whatever? You know, so I mean, if you get to the point of arguing, not in terms of you're wrong, the evidence is wrong, or even the science says this, but ask people to confront their own, to reflect upon their own assumptions. You might not get anywhere, but at least you're, you're actually challenging something which is the basic, the basic root of the problem. I don't think firing bullets of evidence at people is, is going to help because people either dodge the bullets or don't even see them. And I think it has to be, you know, your identity is, is, is engaged in this conversation. Why? Why is this particular belief system important to you? It may have absolutely no effect, whatever. It probably won't. But it's that will be a way. I mean, I, I agree that it's stupid. But it doesn't calling it stupid is only the first label. We, what do we do about it? I rather hope you all kind of go away and have these arguments with your friends and tell me afterwards. You know how you managed using this rubric of of managing uncertainty. Any more questions? Let's do some more. Oh, several. Yes. Thank you, Helen. Um, I, I'd quite like to link two bits of your argument together. You started out by talking about different kinds of uh, certainty and uncertainty and thinking about the future. Yeah. And then you em emphasized the power of storytellings and narratives mm -hmm. and counter narratives uh, to the way we think. So that's got me asking what the, the powerful narratives we can point to that help us to be comfortable with a world which is less certain, given the immense power of the language and narratives that exist to regulate our lives and convince us that things are certain and orderly and there is an answer. So um, you're gonna send me away looking for good examples Probably. of stories that <laughs> subvert that and make us more comfortable with living with uncertainty. I'm not going to make you more comfortable. I, I don't want to make you comfortable living in uncertainty. I'd like to be able to manage it, which is slightly different. 
um, you, you enjoy it rather than feeling uncomfortable with it. It's a good question. I, I think my point that I made in the slide about um, the, the, the last couple of slides, oh, where is it? Um, no, that, there was that, there's that one, but the, um, where are Yes, it's uh, invoking a completely new model. I, I think it's a question of of um, we 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 do have to create new. I mean, change only happens when there are viable new narratives, whether it's in our own personal life or a global story. So, really, what we have to work at is to actually generate um, new narratives, and we do find that they we, we find that they are emerging all the time. Actually, um, I mean, the whole climate change narrative is a new narrative, really. Although we had climate change around for quite a long time, ever since Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, it's really in the last twenty years that the narratives have impacted on on even on our consciousness, let alone on actual policy. So, I mean, I think an, an example I often use because um, it's got so many dimensions to it. I didn't use it this time. Again, again, if I can invoke the fact of shared um, maturity, we can probably all remember a time when, however liberal we were, we were still slightly twitchy about gayness. Um, it was still a slightly problematic area. Now, in the last 40 years, we, there's been a complete and total transformation about how we think about, about, about sexual orientation generally, about being gay, people being gay, the whole concept of managing diversities of, of sexual orientation, such that although there are pockets of people now are still around the world who are homophobic, and in the, including in this country, the narrative has shifted hugely, absolutely hugely, on the whole issue of sexual orientation, and and we can remember what it was like um, in the in the nineteen sixties. If we had, we probably didn't even know if we had gay friends, um, let alone um, talk to them. So, I mean, I think that's an example of a social change that's taken place in our lifetime. We can always use the microchip, but I think things like that, which we lived through, we can really remember the changes and how we felt. When we were teenagers thinking well hang on wait a minute they're gay mm -hmm. not quite sure i mean you know in the 50s so i don't know if that answered your question but i do think the grand narratives the big narratives are what happens when you get a new narrative you get a new way of thinking and covid gave us against our will <laughs> a lot of new narratives as we may remember we've got some couple more people want to ask questions i think there's somebody here don sorry thank you Thank you. Um, I wanted just to take you back to the beginning of your, your lecture where you painted a world of uncertainty yes. um, around COVID and uh, the backlash against woke. Um, uncertainty is unsettling, particularly for young people. And I wondered how far you think that's intertwined with the dialectic of hope, because one of the things that's quite difficult for our society post the 20th century uh, increasingly secular um, is that opportunities for hope, genuine hope, seem to, to fade if we're not careful. And uh, young people have trouble with that. And I wondered how you thought hope was intertwined with uncertainty. That's a very profound question, actually, because in one sense, I mean, I, I know there are quite a lot of people who are saying that we should be giving hope to young people and not really challenging the uncertainty issue, but really focusing more on giving people a sense of hope, almost a, ment almost a, ment excuse me, a mental health approach. Um, and um, I think we do need hope. I just don't know how to provide it, except by giving people the capacity to reflect and take, con take kind of control of their own anxieties. If we can get people to recognize the anxieties they feel and ask the question of why things matter, where they're coming from, then I think we can then say, well, actually, I, I believe in, I mean, there's plenty of play its face in the thing I'm talking about, say, I believe in such and such, it's important, I'm going to argue for it. Um, and I will produce all the evidence I need. And it's, I mean, we're not talking about creationists now, they, they presumably also have some kind of hope, but talking a bit more generally, I mean, I think if you have if you have a sense that um, you have some kind of control, so I put the slide of ages, agency and, and, and responsibility up, because I think that's important. Feeling one can actually have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm losing control of my throat. Um, I'm 
Some friends of mine in the States are doing work on the idea of purpose, helping young people to have a develop a sense of purpose. Now they're focusing at focusing a fairly individual level, but you know, how do you give young people a sense that they <coughs> there is a purpose in their own lives, what they want to do, what they want to achieve? And I think that's a form of hope. <coughs> if you believe you know what you want to do and you can do it, that's a version of hope. <coughs> Excuse me. Having burst in rather rudely last time, I would like to thank you for your talk, which I thought was an excellent overview of the topic. Um, but a couple of things I've come across personally is that I have met some flat earthers and they don't believe it. I don't think they really do. It is the, being a member of a, a countercultural group right. that really matters to them. Mm. And I think that really is, is what it's about mostly, because they know that, that a lot of things they say are, have been disproved, but they're just so keen to be a member of this group. And they'll say what a good, strong group it is and how much they enjoy getting together um, and, and, and sharing the information. Yes. And, and following on from that, I remember listening to a discussion with a couple of very fundamentalist religious people and a scientist was trying to get through to them and couldn't. But a biblical scholar could because he yes. pointed out their actual interpretation of yes. the documents right. was incorrect. Yeah. And he had the knowledge. It's inside, it's inside the narrative. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. And, and finally, I think the thing that gives you hope, gave me, I remember when I was a sort of upset teenager, the thing strange that gave me hope was Camus. And I think I'm not alone in that. I found his writings enormously inspiring. Ah, yes. Yes. But as far as flat earthers and being the, 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 the supportive group, yeah. yes. Actually, groups are important, but we have to, you know, some groups are somewhat uh, noxious. But uh, yeah, we, we we know that groups are important and they're important. But the thing about a group is it can be, um, it can be a place where you can actually explore and, and push the boundaries, or it can be a way of closing the fences, building the barricades around you. So yes, um, is one, one I think we have one question here. Back. I'm sorry, I'm going to sit down. Yes, I hope we're not taking, straining your voice too much, Helen. To lift my knees now. Yeah. I don't think with my knees, but they have an important was... function in being able to enjoy Q and A. Uh, I can hear you if I can't see you. Yes. It's okay. Thank you very much for your talk, Helen. Um, just a couple of points. I'm. Um, I used to chair something called the, uh, the Cheltenham branch of the Skeptics in the Pub. And uh, we used to have talks from lots of people, including the chairman of the Flat Earthers. Um, and I can assure you, he absolutely believed in it. Um, but one of the things I've learned, having uh, studied the psychology of, of uh, cult leaders and lots of other uh, interesting folks, is, is that you cannot rationalise. And I think what we're talking about here is evidence and science mm. and things like that. You can't rationalise for people that are irrational. And there are huge sections of, of humanity, either because of religion or culture or their psychological makeup, that unfortunately are irrational. And in that situation, um, it, they're very easy to predict because you, you can look at the, the, their, their beliefs, but um, you are deemed to be... Um, better than somebody if you you believe in something without any evidence so the the sort of the, the top of the pin the pinnacle of it if you like is is the more you have belief the less value you put on evidence anyway and in that situation you've got a sort of juxtaposition completely because you can never rationalize with them yeah. um so that, that's that's just a one point the i was interested though that you haven't um address things like artificial intelligence, because um, what we're finding more and more is that actually humans are, and from a psychological perspective, in, interested in your position here, is that we are not necessarily <clears throat> as much thinking creatures as we might like to think we are, mm -hmm. that actually we are driven by um, epigenetic um conditioning and, and all kinds of things. And actually, when you start looking at what the power of AI, it, it's frightening how it can predict human behavior and flocking and all these sorts of things. Um, and actually, um, 
we are at the end of the day really just just animals um and that uh, sometimes that can feel very hopeless um when we realize that that we we can't always change significant aspects of our future etc anyway there's a lot there but i just yeah, thought okay. i'd share I'll that i answer your question um i i think the thing is that, that let me take ai first i have to say I am going to what's the, what's the great recognition? Take a rain check on that because I, I it's a huge area. It's a lot of things are happening very very fast. Some of it really rather rather um, uh, irrational actually. It's a lot of fear of AI, which is um, which which is like going back to the fear of robots. I, and I feel that we're not in a position at the moment to judge the implications of AI because everyone's writing stories about it, often with absolutely zero evidence or knowledge. So I, I'm I'm avoiding getting involved in that discussion, and so I, I can't really answer the question. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> I don't think I would answer the question if you don't mind, because I really just don't feel adequate to do so. But your <laughs> first question about the fundamentally rationality of people, yes, um, <clears throat> I think the thing is that I, I I've hinted at this. In in science, we know that the thing that shifts. The, the, the theory is uh, the anomaly, it doesn't fit. And when people take anomalies seriously, as opposed to you know reasoning why they, they're actually error, then you get change. And I would say that it happens inside our brains and our psyches and our identities also. When something happens to us that makes us see things differently, then we see things differently. Now you're all, again, I, again, I mean, I'm plugging for a bit now, but the, we've all lived like, we've all in this room lived long enough to have had experiences which suddenly changed quite a lot, what we thought, what we felt, who we loved, who we didn't love, etc. We know what happens when these things come out of the blue. Um, and we know how much adjustment is needed and, and how much adjustment goes through. And how at the end of it, quite often, we see things differently and more richly. So I think that a lot of the time, you know, life, life itself brings the anomalies that will enable people to, to face some certain areas of irrationality. Now, I don't know if you can manufacture the kind of irrationality that would give people um, a flat earth or any doubts. I suppose if you flew them around the world three or four times. But if the, if the views from space, from the, from, the, from the moon landing space, those wonderful photographs of the moon haven't removed the flat earthers' uh, beliefs, then not much will. But um, I think more generally, I think that we, we, do, we, we do encounter things that coming out of the blue alter our perspectives quite dramatically. We can manufacture that. We can certainly manufacture it in education by giving children exposure to, to controversial and provocative issues. We can also manufacture it to an extent in conversation by, as I said, going deeply into, into, into asking the kind of questions that make people confront their assumptions, not the evidence, their assumptions, because they can all say the evidence is wrong, but the underlying assumption, the why do you believe this, not the what you believe, Kind of approach. I'm not sure I can have a, give you an answer, um, uh, but that's that would be my position at the moment. <clears throat> well, I wonder. Time's getting on, so maybe we should uh, draw to a close and not uh, strain Helen's voice anymore. <clears throat> but uh, I'd like to say that this was one of a very much one of our better talks. It was very interesting, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Helen. Well, thank you.